This podcast is brought to you by the Resolve Long Horizon Investing Masterclass, a 10-part evergreen podcast series where Adam Butler, Mike Philbrick, and Rodrigo Gordillo of Resolve Asset Management Global explore an advanced investment framework specifically designed to steward quasi-permanent capital with humility and balance. From the science of decision-making to all-weather portfolio construction to the value of diversified alpha and tail protection, this series provides a comprehensive capital management roadmap to improve outcomes for wealthy individuals, advisors, family offices, and institutions managing less than $10 billion. To listen to the series or read the transcripts on demand, please visit investresolve.com forward slash masterclass. Alternatively, you can find it on your favorite podcast player by searching for resolve dash masterclass. All right. All right. Doomberg Nation. We have Doomberg. Guys, how you doing? I have to what say, a good looking fella. I have to say, I am an institution managing far less than $10 billion, so I am in the right place. <laughs> Master classes for you, Doomy, without a doubt. <laughs> and before we get started, Mike, please do well, the yeah, honors. I, this is the one time I'm going to change the the whole thing, but because obviously, if you're watching this on four o'clock on a Friday afternoon of a Memorial Long Weekend, Memorial Day Long Weekend, you should definitely be taking all of this as advice, especially when it's an animated chicken talking about it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there's that's no that's... regulator. There's no regulator that's going to look at this and be like, "Yeah, that was meant for real." Listen, you tell Gary Gensler that my weekend started two hours ago, and everything I say <laughs> is ascribed to the ball of Kim Crawford that I've uh, been there you I've go. been away at. And yeah. uh, no, it's really you can't re be responsible for any of it. Yeah, yeah that's right. So in all seriousness, listening, it, if you didn't know and you can't see the Doomberg chicken, it's not that's a rice. Right. <laughs> and we're going to have some fun, interesting conversations, digging down some holes that are pretty awesome. Anyway, there we go. Over to you, Rich. Yeah. Yeah. No, I mean, for anybody who's just listening, we are uh, faced with an avatar of a green chicken in front of us and the pseudonymous character Doomberg is with us today. So I guess we start there. Why pseudonymous? Why a green chicken? Uh, tell us a little bit about the origin story of Doomberg. Yeah, sure. So um, we were talking a bit on, off air before we hit record. And um, we're a, a, a team of former executives from the commodity sector that don't really come at this from the Wall Street side. We come at it from the indus industrial side, which makes us kind of unique. Most people in industry don't speak publicly. They speak through public relations teams and um, communication specialists, and they don't speak the truth. And uh, we have several decades of experience on the team and the freedom to speak the truth. And, and we sort of had a consulting firm that we were managing and then COVID hit and blew all that up, as you can imagine. And we reinvented ourselves consulting in the content creator space, actually, that the subset of that space that serves Wall Street had a pretty good success there, made a name for ourselves, helped a few clients do really well. One of them in particular encouraged us to do our own thing. Which Were we you GS Elevator? Uh, no. <laughs> no. <laughs> I wish. Um, That's and, one of our uh, clients, but I can't yeah, tell you that. <laughs> yeah. Um, but we, um, we decided, hey, we have zero social media presence. We have nothing to start with but our idea. The barrier to entry in this business is zero, but the barrier to success is very high, as you guys know. And um, so we decided we needed to create a character that stood out. Like when you're scrolling Twitter, and you see something interesting and then you stop and you look at it you know you go you make the journey from impression to engagement and uh, the green chicken does that and um since we're a team and i'm just sort of the outward facing spokesperson for that team it didn't feel right to be a person um and then once the brand blew up which blew up well beyond our wildest imaginations we did a sort of study of anonymous accounts that blew up that later de-anonymized and and the brand intrigue kind of collapses. And so there's hundreds of people on Wall Street who know we are who we are in real life. And it's not like we're, you know, uh, I jokingly say it's not like we're doing writing these pieces from prison, like we don't have anything to hide. Um, it's just that um, once it blew up, we didn't want to ruin the brand. It's a good mystique. It's a good image. And it does catch the eye. You know, if you're scrolling through YouTube and you see Doomberg as a guest on a serious podcast, always cracks me up when we're like a, a, a call in guest at a Say an online conference and we have all these serious people with their suits and their ties and their professional mugshots and there's a stupid green chicken you know right next to them as though and the co-equal amongst them you know and, and and it's just really blown up and it's worked and once you're sort of in it why would you stop and we're having the time of our life this is the work of our life it's been enormously successful and we're just going to keep doing it like when you one of the things i tell everybody um when you find out what you're supposed to be doing in life keep doing it so yeah. we're just going to keep being the green chicken and having a blast and talking to guys like you on a Friday before Memorial Day and 
enjoying the weekend and getting right back at it, publishing another piece this morning, got another one in, in the works for hopefully Tuesday, maybe Wednesday. And, you know, it, it's just an amazing thing to get up every day and do exactly what it is that you were meant to be doing in life. And uh, we intend to savor it, not take any day for granted. And it's just a real blessing. Just, just out of curiosity, have you been invited to any of the major networks like CNBC, Bloomberg? <laughs> like, is that have they even contemplated it? Um, we've been on, let's think, we've been on a Reuters sponsored webinar, I believe. But no, we would never get invited on TV. Um, yeah. And that would be useless for our business, by the way. Like, the entire market inefficiency that we're exploiting is the complete futility of um, the sort of modern um, uh, sort of uh, establishment media as it pertains to truly understanding what's going on in the world and then how that in particular impacts the finance world. And, and this is the category that we've tried to help define. And, and it's sort of a subculture. And um, I suppose getting on like, I don't know, Tucker Carlson's show when he had one um, would have been good for the brand maybe i i don't know like it you just sort of um there's a whole subculture of content that is just 100 percent um you know uh, dependent on your success is 100 percent dependent on the quality of the work you produce it, it is a total meritocracy which is another reason to be anonymous like we don't come at it with some big resume that people think oh i have to go and like read that because so and so wrote it the words and the ideas and the phrases and the writing stand on its own it's the ultimate capitalist system we started with nothing. We had zero followers on Twitter and zero email subscribers when we started. We're up to a quarter million on Twitter and 160,000 emails on Substack. Um, and it's only because of the quality of work that we're doing, we hope, knock on wood. And I think the most important thing is this maniacal focus on continuous improvement that we have on the team, where we authentically measure everything and say, what didn't work and why? You know, And that's um, one of the things we've really discovered through this process, because again, writing a blog, Barrett entry zero. Um, disciplined execution is still a durable moat. You could take any old school business with standard economics, and if you put your, you know, really put the elbow grease in, measure everything, measure, analyze, improve, and control, classic sort of Six Sigma corporate methodology, um, the data will tell you what you're doing wrong, and the data will tell you what you're doing right. And if you don't like the data, the market doesn't care. Yeah. Um, so you could either listen to the data and do better. Um, for example, we put a piece out this morning and, and it's just done okay, even though we love the piece and it's great. I know why that piece didn't do well. And the reason why that piece didn't do well, I mean, it's done well. Our existing subscribers kind of like it, but the, the market of people who might be interested to read Doomberg are big Warren Buffett fans. And we took a bunch of shots at Warren Buffett before they cut to paid. And that probably is why the piece is just doing so, so, so. Um, but we know that, and we kind of knew that going in. We have strong opinions about Warren Buffett, and ultimately, we're at the point where we can be authentic with ourselves and not really worry about just you know writing to the audience or you know trying to convert subscribers. But um, the overlap in the Venn diagram of people who would be interested to read Doomberg and are huge fans of Warren Buffett is not zero. It's probably pretty comprehensive. We have strong opinions on the man, and we poke fun at him from time to time. This was a piece where we really poked fun at him, and um, you know. It is what it is. I, I did like all the citations as well. And I do <laughs> find that I rail against Mr. Buffett just because everyone thinks he's just this pleasant old man. Oh, yeah. Uh, sipping, sipping his Coca-Cola and eating five his a day. popcorn yeah. five a day. No problem. Same but house then, he's been in since 58. Yeah, nothing yeah, we, to see here. But we call, I mean, we call him Mr. Oshucks, you know. Yeah, uh, exactly. Mr. Oshucks. He's, he's the best. Anyway. Yeah. That Look, is to be the fair, the man industry. is a brilliant business executor. Oh. With and it. let's like call a spade a spade. The guy is a hmm. shark. He will press every advantage and yep. he will crush his competition. And he is a ruthless executor like Carl Icahn. Let's just yeah. let's yeah. just cut with the uh, America's grandpa nonsense. Yeah. Right. I mean, you know, yeah. Well, and I would... and, and the, the, the extension of it is that people seem to think that, oh, I'll read a book like Warren Buffett or I'll, I will invest like Warren Buffett in some way, shape or form. Right. And I will get the returns. And this this is the grand sort of lie, if you will, that's that kind of perpetrated and everyone gathers in Omaha for the hoaxy, you know, oh shucks uh, <laughs> type of scenario. And you're, you I, just look at it and you go, here's wow, my advice. Do, do like we don't, yeah. we don't give investment advice. We don't give investment advice. and certainly not on this show. But yeah. if you want to invest like Warren Buffett, buy Berkshire Hathaway. It's not that complicated. The guy <laughs> is a success. Like I would put money behind him. I would love it if he would take, you know, my money to personally manage. I, I, I don't have that. It's the, 
the wrapper of nonsense around him and the reputation that he has tried. That's what we're kind of making fun of. And in the piece um, today, uh, again, I'm only telling this story because like we have a mindset of authentic continuous improvement and measure the numbers. And, and why didn't this piece land? It didn't land because we made fun of Warren Buffett. But Warren Buffett is stuffing, you know, um, rural farmers with wind farms they don't want because he's got a monopoly, uh, mid, you know, uh, Mid-American Energy has a monopoly on wind turbines in the Midwest. And by the way, he's uh, lobbying uh, hard for uh, subsidies for wind and against subsidies for solar. Why? Because he's a brass knuckles brawler. And that's fine, but let's just call him what he is. And so, but it is what it is. And we kind of knew when we published it that having that kind of a uh, bit of a poking uh, at the Oracle of Omaha above the cut to paid was probably going to mean that this piece would uh, would not fly. So, so how do you balance that, Doomy? Like, how do you how do you balance the truth versus what will sell down the channel? Well, we have a very strong conviction, which is um, we always write exactly what we believe. Um, and, and we never, um, are going to compromise. So if we were forced to write something that we didn't believe just to drive subs, we wouldn't do that. Right. Um, but you do have to be mindful of your audience. And, uh, so for example, we're far more interested in crypto than our audience. We built our audience on the back of our knowledge of energy and commodities and some sort of, uh, macro. We have a, a deep interest in crypto. We're fascinated by the space for lots of reasons we can get into. But when we publish a crypto piece, it, it doesn't do well. But we still publish them once in a while. Because like it's not just about driving the subscriber numbers. And um, we do have some of our subscribers who enjoy learning about crypto. Um, for I'll give you another example. Um, we're pondering beginning to write a whole series of articles about cancer. Um, cancer is widely interesting to people. It is also, I think, interesting to investors. It is a fascinating area. And we are debating how to sort of work it into the brand. Um, it, so it, it would never be that we would write a piece just for the clicks. But we do ha have to, you know, one of the things that we say as we built this business is every business can be described by how they define who their ideal clients are, how they discover where their ideal clients hang out, how they entice them to come and consume their product, and how they delight them once they do. And we've built a very good business with thousands of ideal clients. And we are mindful of the types of things that they like to read. And we want to service that. But the, the overlap has to be that we authentically believe it. We enjoy writing it. We love the piece. And it also pleases them. And sometimes we like to stretch them a little bit and get them to think a little bit differently. Uh, but one thing we would never do is say, hey, if we just write a clickbait piece about A, B, and C, um, it will drive subs. And so we should do that. I'll give you an example where I know that we annoyed many of our ideal clients, but we, we decided to write a piece about this Palestine, Ohio train derailment um, and to try to tell people like, just like, this is a big deal locally and it's a modest deal regionally and it's a nothing burger nationally. And we knew because it becomes so hyper-political, Tucker Carlson was running stories on it. And, you know, the, the young guy who comes before him was really just blowing this up. I, I forget his name. And our audience, because we write critically about, you know, renewables and, and because Biden is, a, we've only ever written with Biden as a president, we have a lot, and we, so we write critically about whoever's in power and Biden happens to be in power. Um, we knew that writing a piece saying, wait a minute, like, let's stop with the hyperbole. This is a very big deal in a very small circle of like, let's say five square miles. And beyond that, it, it very quickly dissipates to almost nothing. And no, people in Mississippi don't need to be buying bottled water. And no, the air quality in New York is not going to be affected by a fire in Ohio. Um, that annoyed a lot of our subscribers because um, it had become political and, and we, we skew to the right. And many of our ideal clients are conservatives and, and would probably vote Republican in most elections or libertarian probably um, disproportionately. But we decided that that was like the right thing to do. We happen to have pretty deep domain expertise and a unique audience to be able to address that. And we actually made that piece free for everybody because we thought it was, you know, such an important topic at the time. It was a mania, it was a mania as you recall. Like it was a full blown, a crazy mania, especially for people. Like, and I, we have lots of contacts in the industry having spent two decades in it. And after we wrote that piece, our phone blew up with all the executives we know in the industry and our contacts in government 
thanking us for writing that piece because nobody else could say it. Right. Um, and so that's an example where we wrote a piece. We actually lost a fair bit of subscribers because of that piece. But you have to stay true to your values. And I think in the long run, integrated over years, staying true to your values is, is value enhancing. Yeah, without a doubt. I guess, I guess it gives you that, the green chicken gives you that non-cancelable type of a little bit of protection in that realm anyway, if you want to take on and publish on these contentious issues. Sure, that, but people can find out who we are. Like, yeah. you know, this they, is- this they, is, Of course they can. Yeah. But I mean, it it, it it does give you that little bit. Yeah. You know, there's it's some not, forethought that's, there and thinking about that. Did you guys see the interview with Elon Musk and CNBC? Uh, yes, we did. When, actually. He, when he's asked about uh, why do you tweet that way, and he goes and says, "Well, I've sure. seen Princess Bride." Yeah. You know, when Indigo Montoya looks at his father, or the guy who killed his father, and says, "Offer me money, offer me power," you know, it's him. It's I. I you know, offer me money. I'm like, if I can't say whatever I want to say. I'm going to say it no matter how much it costs me, right? Well, when you it's have $100 ability. billion, dollars, it's a little easier Exactly. To say he that. has a definition <laughs> of fuck you money, right? He really yeah, doesn't no. need it. I no, no, feel he, he, like... He, he doesn't have fuck you money. He has fuck me money. I feel like where <laughs> you're... Look, I, I, which, how many which subscribers might be, do you have again? Which might, be, I mean, which might be the first time I've ever sworn on air, but... Um, you know, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> Look, it, the reality is that there's there's enough you you have enough yeah, of a lift yeah. off here where you can you can do and and it, I, I, I've done it a couple of times in my career where I've let's say raised fees, knowing that I was going to lose clients, but it's you're not going to lose all of them if you're adding value. It's the people that get it get it, and you're going to oh, you're going to stay true to yourself, right? Great story. So when we went paid because we were free for a year. We, we did a deep study of who our ideal clients are. Like we are focused mm -hmm. on our ideal clients and our objective is to delight them. And so we literally pondered whether we should have that Warren Buffett paragraph in the piece today because we, you know, we, we want to delight our ideal clients. So we decided it was funny enough and it was cheeky enough. And the little winking gift that we put in just, you know, it was a chef's kiss for the piece. Um, but when we were deciding on pricing, um, we don't give investment advice. And so there's a whole subset of newsletters that, that don't give investment advice, but wink, wink, give investment advice. And they can charge a lot because if they're very good, people are willing to pay for that because they have a direct thing, an action they could take in their portfolio that might more than compensate for the cost of the newsletter. We've never been that. Um, but we, we polled our ideal clients. We probably talked to 40 content creators and 50 ideal clients before we decided to set price. And we set a reasonably high price. Turns out our price was the median of the top 10 finance substacks in the world. And so we weren't above market, we weren't below market, but it was high. $30 a month is a lot for a newsletter that doesn't give you sort of direct investment. You know, we might give you investment concepts. We might teach you things that then you can apply to your investment framework, which is fine. But we're not saying buy this stock uh, entry price 45 and put a-, a No a, strategy a, ideas. There. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, and we got a deluge of hate mail when we, we published what our price was gonna be. Um, but we decided, like we knew none of them were our ideal clients. And our objective was to set a fair price for our ideal clients and to like them. And we had amazing conversion of free to paid when we went behind the paywall. Um, in hindsight, we probably priced it a little cheap, um, but that's okay because we made it up in volume. But um, it, well, it, And you can do a volume business too. I mean, this well, is a right. business. Well, the incremental subscriber doesn't produce incremental work, except for the initial onboarding and thanks for joining and, and we do um, respond religiously to all subscriber emails um, just to try to, again, our objective is to delight our customers. And so, um, and it is a very small team and we do everything personally and people are like, yeah, when you DM the Twitter account, you're interacting with me. Um, and when you send an email to the, the Doomberg account, you're probably interacting with the editor in chief. Um, but we do answer every email, every DM, um, aside from the you know um, Asian clickbait, hi, how are you doing? Um, DMs that we get. <laughs> but, Prince Edward here. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> so you have this freedom, right? You have all this freedom to write about so many topics that you're interested in. You also, you and the team are not shy to engage in controversy uh, from what I've uh, read and listened to. So outside of your core competency in the energy and commodity space, and I guess you might say crypto somewhat falls in that category. How are you deciding 
uh, what you write about, because you guys talked about regulatory capture, policy, geopolitics. You talked about warfare. How are you deciding? Obviously, current events, I would imagine, play some role yeah. there. But what else is driving? So it's, it's hard to articulate, but I could give you like a, a classic way a piece comes to life. I'm on the Internet all day, so we don't take meetings. That's a general rule. The only meetings you ever schedule are podcast appearances now, even for our you know, um, legacy consulting business. Our clients know they can text, email, call. We'll pick up. We're very responsive. The, 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 con the modern concept of a meeting is the giant time suck and a total waste of time. And when we shed that, uh, the world was our oyster. So I spend all day on the Internet, and I see something. And the way a piece typically comes together is I'll read something, and it'll remind me of a story from 20 years ago, because every great piece of writing starts with a story. Um, and it'll um, motivate me to make two or three main points. Like, I read this story. This tells me that A and B are true. And to set the stage where there's a story that feeds the thing I just read, and then I'm going to make A, B, and C post paywall, typically. Um, that's how a piece comes together. And since there's no shortage of crazy news, especially in the energy sector, and there's no shortage of stories that I've read in the 30 years that I've been a professional, um, I have this, you know, um, I have a sort of molecular map of how the world actually works. So a great story, you know, a great example of this is the um, piece we wrote last year called Moribund Verbund. Um, describing what had to be the fate of BSF in Germany, which is an iconic chemical company that I know very well. I've spent countless visits to Luxushaven in Germany, and it's a really amazing place. And and they invented ammonia, and ammonia is the reason why we have fertilizer, and fertilizer is the reason why we have four more billion people on the planet than we could otherwise support. And to see this iconic giant in the industry get their knees cut out from under them because of the insane policies of the Green Party in Germany, um, it's truly amazing. And and we wrote this piece, more bun for bun, God, it must have been like last October or whatever. And then, you know, lo and behold, on Twitter today, like all these months later, um, I'm pulling it up as we're talking, but somebody put a tweet out from the CEO of BSF, basically saying, hey, hey guys, like this is the end of uh, Germany. Yeah, Carl Quintanilla from CNBC put out a tweet this morning quoting the BSF CEO, so let me read it. We've been naive as a society because everything seems fine. These problems we have in Germany are accumulating. We have a period of change ahead of us. I don't know if everyone realizes this. And I retweeted that and said, some of us do. <laughs> like we wrote about this last year. It, you cannot run a integrated chemical site um, with natural gas selling at five times the price that it is in the US. You just can't. And they won't. And every major chemical player in the world is pulling out of Germany. Dow, BSF, pick your favorite. Um, and this was totally predictable from anybody who knows the molecular framework for how the world works. And so we saw you know, a piece about BSF struggles. I have in my head the amazing story of the invention of ammonia and the Haber process at the turn of the century. And then we said in that piece, A, B, C, and D, here's what's going to happen. And by the way, we also knew in our brains that the vast majority of chemical sites, like the Verbon sites at Luxemburghaven, is all back integrated to this natural gas um, plant that is uh, producing electricity and industrial grade steam. So it's not just the commodities like ammonia, it's the stuff that goes into car paint, and it's the stuff that goes into adhesives, and it's the stuff that goes into pick your favorite finished good. Germany is not going to be doing any of that soon, period. They're going to deindustrialize. And so the ability to stitch together a story with an event and three or four consequences is how every Dumber piece is born. I think it's the unintended consequences that you guys are just so good at both falsifying when the world goes in a, in a sort of direction like they did in the train uh, derailment or, or the, 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 the recognition of a change that will happen in an industry long before just because of the unintended consequences. So here's a great example. Heat pump. We The first piece of 2023 for Doomberg was predicting that the words heat pump would be the phrase of the year. It's all you'd hear. It would saturate in the headlines. And sure enough, it's come true. Now, let's talk about like the mother of all unintended consequences. We shared this with our pro tier members in our 
our May Doom Zoom, um, the cheap um, commercial for our, our high end here uh, on Thursday. So what's going on in Germany today? Uh, the average German home has a natural gas powered furnace and no air conditioning. And, you know, kind of sucks in Germany for about two or three weeks in J July and August. It's hot, it's muggy. Most of them go on vacation, maybe, is the thought, so it doesn't matter. But actually, you know, the average citizen doesn't, can't really afford to go to go to the Mediterranean or wherever it is that they vacation. So there's this mandate as of January 1 of 2024 that you basically can't install a new gas furnace. And everyone has to install a heat pump. And this is like the most controversial law that's ever existed in Germany. There's a big piece in the Financial Times today. Let's ponder a certain unintended consequence. The heat pump runs both ways. So you can take um, cold air and make it warm, or you could take warm air and make it cold. So for the very first time, because of this mandate, millions of Germans will have air conditioning. What do you think is going to happen in the summer? They're going to be spewing much more carbon than they used to, and they're going to way more than offset the alleged savings that will come from um, removing all of these natural gas furnaces. And oh, by the way, all the energy that's going to go into reconstructing these homes and making them suitable for heat pumps, nobody ever talks about that, nor the fact that the Chinese basically have a controlling position in the in the heat pump market, nor that we have a transformer shortage. And um, electrifying all of this combustion is probably going to create some challenges. And so there's a, a never-ending series of unintended consequences for us to uh, to talk about. The heat pump one is one of our favorite. And to be totally transparent and fair, we stole that from the annual JP Morgan energy letter. Mike uh, Semblast, I think his name is, I want to give full credit. It's one of those things that you read and you smirk and you say, yeah, that, I'm going to put that away in the back of my mind for a future Doomberg story. And the most so important thing, out. go ahead. No, so I was just going to say, but they haven't out loud the gas stoves in Germany just yet, right? Because oh, no, it's all, no, literally, you, you cannot install a new gas combustion machine after January 1 of any kind. Industrial, residential, they want to electrify everything. And we, because that, that's where it's going in the US, the zeitgeist, uh, or, or at least oh. that's a little bit of the chatter. And you guys wrote a little bit about this as well, right? They were trying to ban gas stoves in the US. Yes. So, yes. So you, yeah. we view the U.S. as five years behind Germany, and we should be watching what's happening. And the reason why we're so fixated on Germany is because Germany, like California is two years behind Germany, and New England is like two and a half years behind Germany. And, you know, flyover country is 10 years behind Germany. But that's the future, so let's watch what happens. And the piece you're referencing was one of our favorites. We wrote in January. It's called Home Cooking. And, um, and as we said in the piece, like if you live in the suburbs and you drive a car and you occasionally barbecue – the environmentalists are coming for you and uh, you best get ready. So, so Doomberg, I, I haven't read that piece and I, you, you lean right. So I'm, I'm guessing I know what the answer is going to be, but okay. Clearly there is a broad push from policymakers to fast track the greening of the economy in, in whatever way. Um, maybe one of them is this natural gas thing, throw out your stoves. Um, do you see value like wh where do you see the role of government in attempting to move society towards a north star in spite of the fact that along the way they're probably going to make bad choices do you think they like there's value in so, governments intervening or no value at all no i absolutely i i am not like a, a pure libertarian it would be great if government started with physics so there's a difference between physics and <laughs> quote the science Right. Amen. Um, physics is is hardwired into um, the universe. So there is a very clear path to decarbonize our grid. It involves no invention and de minimis financial investment. Um, and it has been done several times in the West and it's nuclear. So look at Ontario. Ontario has the, amongst the greenest grids on the planet. Um, I think 60 percent of electricity comes from nuclear and maybe 25 or 30 comes from hydro and um, a small amount comes from uh, natural gas. None of it comes from coal, and uh, the balance comes from renewables. I drove through Ontario recently. There weren't green fish in the lakes. It wasn't like it was a the, the pavement was flat, and the people were polite, and there wasn't garbage on the sidewalk. I it played was a, soccer uh, next it, to the yeah. the uh, Pickering Power Plant my yeah. whole youth, and uh, it was a little insane. odd. 
Well, but it's only odd to be because okay with it. I had an iodine yeah. pill in my pocket just in case. But... <laughs> well, you are clearly a victim of propaganda. Um, <laughs> no, I know it's so so absurd, right? Like, and especially oh, with with the modern the nuclear power plant is going down. Yeah. Let me put pop this this yeah. pill on my mouth. Yeah, Let if you see a green glowing fish while you're playing soccer next to that plant, you got bigger problems than that iodine pill is going to solve. But in all seriousness, France did it, right? Um, it can be done. And my favorite argument from the sort of Malthusian radical environmentalists is um, nuclear is too expensive and takes too long. Well, let's ponder why those two things are. Um, they're too expensive because you have stacked the regulatory agencies with environmental radicals who um, make the industry go to 15 nines instead of nine nines of safety. And then um, it takes too long because you sue at every step of the way to litigate every permit. And um, next thing you know, of course, who wants to you know put capital to work? when you have an NPV calculation and a discount factor, and it's going to take you 15 years to generate revenue. Um, so yes, in the modern regulatory construct, which is a political choice, nuclear is too expensive and takes too long. In a world where government cut all the red tape and said, we're going to do this, um, here's the example. 50 years ago, with technology we had back then, there was no such thing as a computer or an iPhone 50 years ago. I know that's crazy for some of your younger viewers listening. <laughs> Canada put a new Kandu reactor in every year for 20 years. It was systematized. It was supply chain maximized. It was safety oriented. They're all still running. None of them have blown up. The one you played soccer by has just been saved, thanks to the good work of our good friend at uh, uh, Canadians for Nuclear Energy, Dr. Chris Kiefer and his team, in, in no small part, at least. Um, imagine what we could do with 50 years of technological development a motivated government cutting through red tape um, and so on. So yes, of course, there's a role for government. I drive on roads. We, we wouldn't have a national highway system without the government. Um, there, there's, a, there's a role for government, but our government has been corrupted. It has been hijacked. It has been made a mockery of. One of the reasons why government is a joke is because nobody with any talent would ever go into it, or at least nobody with any talent and morals would ever go into it, um, because you have to run the gauntlet of personal destruction just to get there. And then you have to push on the giantess of giant strings, which is trying to get an entrenched um, administrative state to do anything, as Donald Trump found out. Um, and so the only people that distill into government are people that don't have the talent to make their way in the private sector or people who are so loose ethically that they're willing to be totally corrupt. And they go into Congress or they leave a centimillionaire millionaire and everybody smiles. Um, and so I remember reading, uh, watching a documentary. It's quite a while ago, maybe five, 10 years ago. Pandora's Promise, and it talks about all these environmentalists that changed their mind on nuclear, and mm -hmm. they went down the rabbit hole and they realized that much of the propaganda and much of the fear mongering and scare mongering that went on and that kind of now permeates the zeitgeist on nuclear energy was financed by the fossil fuel industry because they had long realized that nuclear was the only viable alternative to fossil fuels. And so it made total sense for them to finance this, this, these hit pieces over and over, over decades in order to scare people into, uh, you know, pushing policy against nuclear. Do, do, do you remember the, uh, do you watch this pod, this sure. uh, documentary? Are you familiar with this, this hypothesis? So there's a, there's a bit of a um, half truth there that has a bit of a nefarious intent in my view. It is unquestionable that the fossil fuel industry has a dirty history in playing ball against the nuclear sector. But the environmentalist movement is born from a much uglier Malthusian eugenicist strain of thought that there's just way too many people on the planet and let's get rid of a bunch of them that don't look like us. Eugenicist. Um, what a, they are, what a, that's a hot take right there, Doomer. It's Well, it. we've written about it and we're not afraid of saying it. And so as part of the cover-up of that, the Sierra Club... Greenpeace, the founders of those organizations were deeply racist, deeply Malthusian, and and strong proponents of the eugenicist movement. Now, that doesn't mean that the, the members of it today would, would ascribe to those beliefs, but there is that strain, that ugly history, and part of the emphasis of the oil and gas sector's role in kneecapping nuclear is meant to deflect from an even uglier history on the environmental side. Now, that's not to forgive what the oil and gas, and look, Oil companies are their worst enemies, like most of the time, like they do nasty stuff. They bribe corrupt governments. They pollute the environment. They cover things up. There's a lot more flaring in the Permian Basin than is officially reported. Like all that stuff is true and is important and needs to be dealt with. 
Um, but you know, that doesn't mean that we should just abandon fossil fuels and allow society to collapse at the same time. And so there's always going to be companies that do bad things that pollute that they, and, and we're all for strict enforcement of pollution controls and so on. And in fact, you know, the associated gas problem in the Permian Basin is, is a real challenge and an opportunity, depending on how you manage it. It's just one example of a really complex thing that government, most government officials have no idea what's going on. And so, you know, back to the original question that started this whole vein, um, there is a role for government. We just wish government would be more competent. And we think one of the consequences of the hyperpolarization of our politics is anybody with competence or decent morals doesn't want to go into it. And so you're left with the still bottoms, the people who are either incompetent or uh, unethical. And then you get what we get. You get Nancy Pelosi. You get, you know, um, uh, pick your favorite on the Republican side, like being wheeled around the Senate because they, 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 it's all just so partisan and so polarizing and so destructive. Nobody starts with what's great for the country. Mm -hmm. To linger I, on nuclear just for a second, can you, I mean, we know that you're a proponent of nuclear that, I, I mean, I've read from some of your pieces that you see uh, no alternative to uh, decarbonizing the planet uh, without nuclear, but can you steel man some of the concerns that exist around nuclear and then could you say why they are they are not as concerning as they might be but but, but can you make a steel man sure. uh, a version could you, of could uh, you of also the concerns? add to that I, i'm curious to know about advanced small modular reactors smrs because sure. i had a yeah. client 15 years ago that said this is it for mining for small towns and then i never heard about it again so well we just wrote a piece on it. so lots of unpack let me let me take it in order um yeah. so first of all there are three options there's, um, well, well, we can't decarbonize without nuclear unless we're willing to destroy everybody's standard of living. And this brings us to the, the sort of overarching point of Doomberg is there are no solutions, there are only trade-offs. So let's be honest and authentic about the trade-offs and then collectively decide with some competence and debate um, which of the trade-offs we're going to accept. And so for nuclear, the only real trade-off is waste and how do you handle it? And the nuclear waste issue has been pounced on it correctly and intelligently by the environmental Malthusians as the greatest scare, scaremongering technique in the history of, of humankind. In the vast history of the nuclear, civilian nuclear sector and all the quote nuclear waste they've generated, you cannot find a single human being on the planet who has ever been injured by nuclear waste, period. You have to weigh that against all the people have died in the oil and gas fields. And, you know, we mm -hmm. had the BP pipeline and we had the Exxon Valdez and we have coal dead mines birds and coal mines, but we have dead birds because of wind turbines and we have slave labor for solar and we pick your favorite. Every technology has its trade-offs. The nuclear waste canard is the most exaggerated piece of propaganda. God, you know, God bless them. Kudos to the environmental rallies. They have won and we should loudly condemn the nuclear power industry. They fell into a trap. They fell into the trap of, if only we could make a few more nines on the probability curve of nothing ever happening, then we'll be okay and they'll leave us alone. They'll never leave you alone. They'll always ask for another nine. And the fact that you're pursuing so many nines tells the non-expert, whoa, this must be a big problem. Dig a hole, shoot it underground, plug the hole, and never think about it again. The odds of a properly encased bunch of radioactive uranium or spent fuel from a... Um, a nuclear power reactor being injected three, four, five hundred 500 meters underground and then plugged ever f leaking from that, finding its way to the surface and hurting somebody is zero. So did and you read so, the fifth risk? Cause I remember reading that, like I hadn't thought about nuclear forever. This is Michael Lewis's book, fifth risk on, on uh, Donald Trump. And he has a chapter there that would terrify anybody about nuclear waste. Uh, then it's total, it's total propaganda. I mean, I've not read it. Um, I don't read yeah. political books, he, but it, it's he, he total nonsense. He a good picture as he generally tends to do. Um, right. So my point is that is a trade-off. We the, the entirety of the nuclear waste we've ever generated could fit on a basketball court. And I think the height of that waste would be 10 meters for the U.S. and 30 meters for the world. Like, don't quote me, but it's something like that. So, so how does Fukushima work into that? Like yeah, Fukushima, and Chernobyl right? and, and, and any right. other fall last that have so, occurred. Yeah. Again, uh, if you actually go and look at how many people died, it is a it is sure. greater than zero, yeah. right? But it is a very small number. Um, 
And last I checked, I flew into Tokyo. Life is fine. Now, there's issues and there's things that you have to manage. There are trade offs. But with the latest fourth and fifth generation, so there's sort of the nuclear sort of has two challenges, right? Like the fleet that we have today that's critical because it provides an enormous amount of our base load power. But then to your question about small, small modular reactors, what does the go forward technology look like? So the sleight of hand of the environmental Malthusians is um, pointing to the worst possible outcomes and applying it to the latest technologies that have 50 years of benefit and have been chasing the seventh, eighth, ninth, and 10th, nine, um, you know, 99.999999. Um, and how many angels, angels on a pin was, I think, the, the title of the piece we wrote about nuclear waste. Like how many of them you want to count before you're comfortable? Um, and so the trade-off is um, we could all destroy our standard of living mm -hmm. or we could pollute the planet um, with fossil fuels and run the risk, take roll the dice on climate change. Or we could all decide that this magic molecule, this, this magic technology, again, it was, it, Josh Wolf, I believe, was the one I first saw say it. Maybe somebody else predated him. If fission was invented today, it would be celebrated as a civilization-saving technology, and we would be uh, implementing it post-haste. Now, one of the real challenges with nuclear energy is the word weapon is associated with it. And people have a, an association of existential threat. So we had the worst possible thing ever happen, a poorly run plant completely melted down in Russia. Um, let's measure that and weigh that against your supposed climate alarmism around emitting CO2 from fossil fuel burning. Let's weigh those two things on a scale and decide what is the probability adjusted risk of fourth generation nuclear technology experiencing something like that versus what you're telling me is we're going to boil the oceans if we keep burning oil and natural gas. So which risk are we going to take? Now to SMR, we wrote a piece called Gaining Steam. I have this memory of all the pieces that we've written um, where we chronicled a really important industrial project between Dow and X Energy um, at an integrated petrochemical site. Um, a, a little known fact, if you add up all of the carbon emissions associated with burning fossil fuels to produce industrial grade steam, those emissions are greater than the sum of all of the automotive and airline emissions in the world. And if you compare the amount of talk we've had around electric vehicles versus, hey, what are we going to do about industrial steam? Well, it turns out fourth generation nuclear reactors can generate pretty good industrial steam. It's not the, it, it doesn't like reach like say cement levels, but you can catch a lot of the base of the pyramid of, of carbon emissions for sort of 500 to 1000 degree steam that um, anybody who's ever worked in the industry knows. There's a reason why cogen plants based on natural gas are so popular at these integrated sites. It's because you produce both electricity and you make use of the excess heat. And so the, I think like the cogen overall efficiency of energy in the molecule of methane going in versus the work that you extract out of it is something like 80% as opposed to when you just burn it to produce electricity, it's probably like in the mid fifties, I think. Um, so if you can have a nuclear power plant instead of a gas powered turbine um, that produces both electricity and steam, which is what the Dow X energy project purports to demonstrate, um, you have a game changer. Like you could truly attack a huge slug of our carbon emissions with, once you sort of roll these out, very little sacrifice to our way of life. Um, and so it's technologies like that. We don't want to just be Doomberg. We don't want to just make fun of nonsense. You also want to highlight potential proposed solutions that people could get behind. Another piece that we wrote about a very fascinating little company called, um, the piece was called Rice Aroni. And R-O-N-I is the SPAC, and this is not investment advice, but the Rice Brothers, um, who are notorious in the energy sector and uh, EQT and, and all the natural gas companies that they've made tons of money for shareholders for. They've taken to, to market a, um, a pretty interesting technology that purifies oxygen out of the air so that when you burn natural gas to produce power, you get pure CO2, which you can then inject underground um, for carbon capture and sequestration without having to pay the entropic and economic penalty of trying to capture CO2 from a dilute mixture of air um, on the back end of a power plant. That's a very fascinating technology. And that's pretty interesting. 
the, the real challenge with that technology is, and we sort of say it in low voices because we don't want the Malthusians to hear it, is the enabling economic driver of carbon capture is actually enhanced over recovery. <laughs> um, but, you know, I digress. So injecting CO2 underground allows you to get more oil out of the ground, which allows the value of that CO2 to be recognized and to be something that, you know, companies want. Um, but I digress. You can, in theory, run a power plant on natural gas, which we have an enormous amount of, where the product coming out of that um, is pure CO2, which is very easy to capture, to compress, and shoot underground. And so you can have embedded in the technology carbon capture. Th those types of solutions exist, and there's no shortage of engineers that know how to implement it. Um, so there are practical ways. For Again, here's the equation that we should be trying to optimize. We like to say energy is life and your standard of living is defined by how much energy you get to waste. You, Richard, you, Mike, you, Rodrigo, how much energy you personally get to waste dictates how many right angles will surround you when you go to bed. Um, the equation that we should try to optimize is how much standard of living are we going to create for all of humanity? We could talk about how to equitably distribute that standard of living later, divided by our carbon emissions. This gets back to the trade-off. So let's optimize that equation. And when that is your equation, when you have a human standard of living variable you're also mindful of, and you divide it by, hey, let's try to get rid of as many carbon emissions as we can, then deductive reasoning leads you to nuclear. It just, it, there should no other way. So you mentioned Ontario as having, you know, as close to a green grid as you can imagine in this day and age. I would imagine you would point to Germany as perhaps one of the countries with the most dysfunctional uh, energy policies, especially with how much they uh, relied on a potential geopolitical fall. We'll get to that in a second. But if you could put on a spectrum, some of the best country, some of the countries with the best or more cogent energy policies, countries with some of the worst and where the US fits in that continuum. Yeah, Germany, given where it started is unquestionably the worst. And in fact, if you looked at the carbon intensity of their grid this winter, it was amongst the brownest in Europe because they retreated to the coal mines with the speed and efficiency of the evacuation of Dunkirk once they realized the jeopardy they were in. You know, look, the, and the wood. rest of the, And wood, right? Oh, they, they, wood, they, they, coal. Look, here's what Germany did. They saw the crisis coming and they realized they screwed up. And by the way, no country has preached to the developing world the need to cut their carbon emissions stronger and louder than Germany, okay? So let's talk about the path function and why it matters. So Germany saw a crisis coming and they took off their masks and they scoured the world and, and they bought every BTU of energy they could get their hands on, regardless of cost, carbon footprint and impact on the developing world. So if you're Pakistan, quarter billion people, by the way, people just like the five, four of us on this call. Um, if you're Pakistan who had a grid wholly dependent on liquefied natural gas, and you had been lectured to by the Germans for years about how you needed to de decarbonize your grid. And then you saw them buy every carrier of LNG they can get their hands on and every cargo of coal they can get their hands on and every um, ship full of, um, of clear cut trees from the U.S. Southeast um, that they could burn. Um, you're saying, OK, when push came to shove, my grid collapsed. I'm the one that has the political upheaval. Guess what I'm going to do? I'm going back to coal because I could make a giant pile of coal and I got coal and I could buy coal. And I'm going to make a giant pile of it and screw you and your carbon emissions. Billions of people will have walked away from their carbon commitments because of what Germany did in the winter of 2022, period. They, saw, they are watching what they did and not listening to what they said. And so Germany is the poster child for how to do it wrong. Now, which countries are doing it right? Um, France, if it could get its act together on actually maintaining and not trying to handicap their own nuclear power. Within France, there is a school of radicals in power that are doing everything they can to make their nuclear reactors perform poorly so that they can um, that they can push to get them shut down just like they did in Germany. That has since, I think Macron has correctly identified that issue and I believe that is going to be solved. Um, Ontario has done it spectacularly well. Um, the US is a mixed bag. I think, um, California, New England, obviously, are catastrophic, catastrophically stupid. Um, and then we have a gradient in between. And there's some stupidity on the right where we're just going to keep burning coal. And like we, we, we ran the math um, on a piece um, that we wrote recently about, you know, the regional disparities of natural gas prices in the U.S. and, and so on. And um, it turns out that if you add up 
how much natural gas we are either flaring in the field or exporting because we don't really have any use for it here, it roughly balances the total amount of coal we're burning in the country. So instead of flaring and or exporting our natural gas bounty, um, we could literally displace all the coal we're burning. Now, there's a coal lobby and you know, uh, Joe Manchin from West Virginia, and, and there's all kinds of um, nefarious actors on the other side of the energy equation who are protecting vested interests, and they should be just as admonished and highlighted as, as the Germans are. But we have so much natural gas in the country. Um, it's incredible. The piece we wrote on it is called Guilt by Association, if anybody's interested to read it. Um, and we talk about the, the challenge of associated natural gas, especially in the Permian Basin. And, and we had literally in December, in California, because they refused to build any pipelines, natural gas was trading at $55 per million BTU, while it was priced negatively in the Permian Basin in Texas. It was priced negatively because the main reason why people are drilling in the Permian is to produce oil, and they got to do something with this natural gas. And so Amazing. for the lack of a pipeline, you had this really valuable molecule being given away in Texas, and they were starved for it in California. Now, you tell me if that is isn't an indictment of sort of the so when you say what is the, the U.S. policy, there isn't a U.S. policy. There's a fragmented series of regional policies, um, much the same in other countries. But another country that is blessed with great resources and has done well is Norway. They have a huge amount of hydro. Um, and then Finland recently turned on a, a world scale nuclear reactor and suddenly their electricity prices went negative and they had to actually throttle back um, the amount of nuclear they're putting onto the grid because it became windy or it was sunny. I forget which. Um, and so dealing with the intermittency of, of renewables. Um, and then another country that I would mention is the United Arab Emirates. Uh, they've been on a decades long journey of nuclear power. They just turned on their third of four planned uh, nuclear reactors. They have an amazing internal culture around creating the workforce they need to sustain these things. 25% of their uh, electricity for the next 80 years will come from carbon free nuclear power. Um, they've already invested the money. It will, quote, cost to do that effectively. The marginal cost of their electricity for the generations that they're leaving their economy to will be de minimis. Um, kudos to them. They had the planning and the fortitude and the foresight to uh, to see those projects through. And that's a real success story as well. And by the way, any country in the world could do that. It's United Arab Emirates. It's a tiny country. They just decided they want to go nuclear. They bought the best technology. I think they worked with the Koreans. Um, and um, they have the workforce, they have the education, they have the popular support, and now they have a grid they can count on. It's there. There's, the, the winning is a choice. Let's choose to win. Where does uh, solar power and battery technology come into this whole thing? So battery technology, well, let's we'll do solar first. Solar is very seductive, and we are less harsh on solar than we are on wind for a variety of reasons. Um, we are bombarded every day by orders of magnitude more energy than we could ever possibly harness by the sun. And the prospect of figuring out how to stick your hand out the car window and just grab a few of the dollars that are flowing by is very seductive. And one that we, and of course, I personally have several years of direct experience in the solar industry and I know it well, so much so that I'm able to write, um, we think pervasively about how China stole that market from the US because we were in the market and they stole it from us uh, at the time. And so um, the solar industry is interesting. The, 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 one of the, so anytime you assess a technology like solar or batteries, and I'll take them in turn, you have to actually fairly see the world as it is. And, and to do that, we always have the, what we call, what are the pros, what are the cons, and what is the propaganda? So with solar, there's a bunch of pros. The pros are um, it, it's, the efficiency isn't impacted by scale. So a solar panel is going to generally work as well sitting on a home as it is sitting in a giant commercial array. Now, that's not totally true. You can orient the panels a little bit with some control. But really, um, you know, I have a Jackery battery system and I have some solar panels that go with it. And when I'm out of my lake property, it, it fires up and it juices the battery and I can run my power tools. And it's really great. It's really fantastic. It's portable. Um, you know, the, the, the scaling efficiency factor is, is pretty small, which actually means it's, it can be easily distributed. Um, it's pretty efficient. It's pretty, um, pretty uh, you know, uh, well known how to make these things, how, how to install them. It's pretty commoditized. Um, and it works really well in areas where you have a lot of sun. It works really terribly in areas where you don't have a lot of sun, especially Germany, um, you know. But solar 
has a chance. It's more predictable. Um, you know for sure it's not going to work at night, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Batteries, um, batteries for grid storage is about the dumbest idea that exists, especially lithium ion batteries. Um, it, we're a firm believer that we are constrained for the metals that we need for batteries. And so if we are constrained by battery metals, then we should take a step back and say, what is the most carbon impact we can have? And then, and then let's, ex let's manage to that constraint. So let's take 100 kilowatt, or let's say an 80 kilowatt hour battery in a Tesla Model 3. If you create one 80 kilowatt hour battery, you're going to abate the fossil fuel consumption well, the gasoline consumption, I guess, because depending on how they recharge that battery, you're not really abating the fossil fuel consumption. Um, but the gasoline consumption of one driver, 100%. If you split that battery into four and you make four plug-in hybrids and you abate 80% of the gasoline consumption of four drivers, it doesn't take too much math to know that 320 is greater than 100. And that for that same 80 kilowatt battery pack, I'm abating far more gasoline. And yet, environmentalists and, and governments around the world are strongly favoring BEVs over plug-in hybrids, even though for the same amount of battery, we could, we could abate so much more carbon emissions. So now let's take that story and apply it to battery storage. If you take all of the storage that's ever been implemented, battery storage, not hydro storage, this is a whole different thing, <clears throat> and you um, calculate how much of the US energy grid have we backed up with all of this billions of dollars we've spent, it's seven minutes. So it just doesn't work. Um, and by the way, as backup power for the grid to make room for intermittency when we have nuclear power as an option and we could be using those batteries to make plug-in hybrids so that we can abate, like it, it, no decision is in a vacuum. Like you, you have a constraint, which is battery materials. Given that constraint, what is the most impactful thing we can do for the thing you claim to care about the most, which is our carbon emissions? Back to our equation, standard of living divided by carbon emissions. We would right, take no, technology that exists today versus yeah. the hope of a better battery technology in the future. Well, let's take hydrogen. No. If, if, if we had a fleet of nuclear reactors spinning electrolyzers making hydrogen, we could burn them in cars. The hydrogen combustion engine is a fine technology. It's mastered. It looks very similar to an internal combustion engine. I suspect you could probably retrofit a lot of cars to make that work. Um, so there's a carbon-free world that doesn't involve batteries and it doesn't involve solar and wind. It involves nuclear, making hydrogen and combusting it. The availability of materials or, or the lack thereof that you're referring to for battery technology, is this uh, largely a function of the war in the Ukraine now and the isolation of Russia uh, and, and to some degree, I guess, China controlling a lot of the uh, rare earth minerals in, in Africa and in, in Central Asia, or is that uh, uh, above and beyond all that? So the war in Russia doesn't help anything, but as it pertains to battery materials and rare earths that you talk about, uh, not really. Uh, most of the cobalt we get for batteries comes from the Congo, and we all know that there's a lot of issues in the Congo, child labor and so on. And something like 80% of the, of the economic deposits of cobalt in the world are in the Congo, and so we're kind of stuck there. There's nickel. Um, there's lithium, um, but um, the rare earths that you mentioned are actually for the electric motors. And here again, where China sort of acts at a, at a sort of a, a national level with some strategic thinking, um, they own 100% of the rare earth metal processing. So even if we mine concentrates in the US and we're starting to, we're starting to get our head around the fact that maybe we should have some domestic supply chain, especially given the criticality of these materials to our, our military. Um, <clears throat> All of the things we mine in the U.S. ultimately get shipped as concentrate to China so they can purify it. Um, same thing with solar. So we still have three polysilicon manufacturers in the U.S. But the value, you know, the supply chain of solar is you take sand, you pump in an enormous amount of energy, which nobody wants to talk about, to make um, metallurgical grade polysilicon, 98.8. .8. And then you pump in even more energy, vastly more energy, to make it 99.99999 and then an extra nine for semiconductors. Um, and then you slice that into wafers, right? Uh, so, you, so you form that into ignits and then you slice it into wafers and then you mount it as cells and then you make your modules. Well, it doesn't help us to back integrate to polysilicon really 
because 98% of the ignit manufacturing and 99% of the wafering gets done in China. So Hemlock Semiconductor and pick your favorite US-based polysilicon manufacturer is still sending that polysilicon, which they put an enormous amount of energy into to convert it from sand. It gets commingled with slave labor polysilicon and formed into ignits and sliced into 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 wafers, which are then mounted on cells and you know turned into modules that get sent back here, which are now stuck at the border because we have this anti-slave labor act that Congress passed that Biden couldn't veto. And so if you buy a solar panel today, it is <clears throat> almost impossible that at least some of it wasn't made from slave labor uh, because it's all commingled at that one step. So it's the same thing with rare earths that are needed for the, you know, the, the rare earth magnets that uh, power motors and so on. And so um, these are the types of complexities that people who just say we should do wind and solar and batteries and wave their hands and have no idea what they're talking about, but yet still actually impact the levels of political power. Um, that's very, very dangerous. So do you think China is at something of an advantage given their autocratic system uh, to the to the West when it comes to deploying uh, capital towards technological breakthroughs? Do we need something like what uh, preceded DARPA with Vannevar Bush in the 1930s that kind of brought about a lot of the technologies, radar and so on, and code breaking in World War II? Do we need something like that in the West, particularly in the U.S., in order to, to bring about whether it's a uh, battery technology revolution, whether it's the, the possibility of cold fusion, and you can tell us whether that's a pipe dream or, or you know anywhere uh, in the realm of possibility for our lifetimes. Do, do we need something more, uh, uh, you know, uh, government crowding in private investments, something along those lines that allow us to, to, to plan for decades as opposed to uh, every two years with the electoral cycle? So two points. First of all, is trying to add an advantage because of its autocratic system. Um, <clears throat> as measured by their ability to dominate us economically, yes. As measured by how they treat their people and how they treat their environment, nobody here would accept that. And so let's be more like China is not an option on the table, right? Um, they abuse their people. The rare earth metal processing, the reason why we don't do it here is because it's really an environmental challenge, creates an enormous amount of toxic waste, and China basically does a poorer job of dealing with it than we do. And so while you know the people over on this side were trying to do it, they were competing in the market with the Chinese who weren't, and they were being undercut on price and they went out of business. It's just that simple. That's what happened to us in, in solar. That's what happened to magnesium in the US. Um, it's hard to compete against a competitor when your competitor's water treatment plant is a pipe to the river. And, and I competed against people whose water treatment plant was a pipe to the river. And I, I remember talking to the procurement teams of very well-known U.S. brands, which I won't name, who are very high profile at COP27, and they have their pretty booths, and they have their glossy pamphlets about how they care about the planet and their all sustainability. And I remember pitching to them why they should procure our more expensive solar products than our Chinese competitors, because our Chinese competitors were polluting their environment and you could take a stand. And they looked at me and said, that's for the courts to decide. You could either meet this request for proposal or not. And we were out of business. So like, I'm a little jaded on the question because I've lived it. When your competitor is willing to pollute their local environment, to undercut you on price, to gain market share as a national strategic objective, of course, China quote benefits from being an autocratic system because nobody is holding the polluters accountable. And they as a country have decided for their own nationalistic ob ob objectives that they wanna own solar and they wanna own batteries and they wanna own rare earth metals and they wanna own electric vehicles and they wanna turn around and, and fill our country with propaganda to make us all believe that this is where we should go. Otherwise we hate the planet. And who is the, who's the seller? I mean, they're the drug dealers and they got us all hooked. So, I mean, that, that's my answer to that question. Now, um, I forget what the second part was because I kind of went off on a bit of a bit of a tangent. Well, but... the, the idea of creating some some new forms, oh yes, yes. Uh, <coughs> a DARPA kind, like sure. like financing moonshots and, and, and allowing them to shot. fail. We don't need a moonshot. We have it. The solution exists. It's fission. Let's cut the red tape. Let's fire everybody at the NRC and start over. Let's decide on a fundamental technology like they did in Canada with the can-do reactor system. Let's make it modular. Let's make it super safe. Let's make the permitting easy. Let's make the return on investment viable so that we can finance it. 
that's the kind of moonshot we need. It's not a moonshot of technology. It's a moonshot of politics. That's my main point. We, there is no technology needed to be invented. So let's talk about fusion. You incorrectly called it cold fusion. Just for everybody listening, cold fusion was a fraud and a scam. Fusion, hot fusion is legitimate scientific endeavor. But hot fusion is used by the opponents of existing nuclear technology as a stall tactic to never do fission. And then when fusion comes around, which is decades away, they'll say, oh, they'll find lots of reasons not to do fusion. So we, when we wrote about fusion, we had a picture of Charlie Brown with the football um, because this is what this is. So fusion is great scientifically and we're interested in it. It's a giant distraction. There is no technological advance needed to adequately provide a reasonable standard of living to all the humans we have in the United States while minimizing our carbon emissions. All of the constraints are political. The financial constraints that exist today are second order effects of the political constraints. There are no technical constraints. Fourth generation reactor designs have been around forever. They're walk away safe, basically impossible to melt down. We know how to create the fuel. This is literally the Manhattan project we need is a political one, not a technical one. And anything that we do that says otherwise is a proactive distraction away from the solution that exists and serves China. Can we, just, can we just dissect that a little bit? What is the ramp up time for a viable nuclear plant to replace coal or? It depends ones? on the permitting. So today in the current per permitting structure, it's, it's five to 10 years. But to in begin Canada- To begin to build or to finalize the project? Oh, well, oh, well I think you could probably, if you start, well, let's take the Dow X Energy example. They plan to go live in 2030. That's seven years from today with the existing impossible permitting structure. Let's take can do in Canada in the seventies. And Chris Keeper has a great um, chart on this. And if I can find it, I'll share it um, while we're talking because we'll go ahead and stress that technology. But every year for 20 years, Canada brought on a new can do reactor in the seventies. That was 50 years ago. Tell me there's a technological chance. Those reactors are still running. Right. What's the technology? What are we talking about technology? This is not a technology problem. This is a pure political problem. So once you get going, you can do one every year. I mean, they literally have. And I'm going to find this chart. I'm going to pull it up. I'm just sort of, here it is. OK, good. I found it. So let's go ahead and close all my other windows so you don't see anything that I don't intend for the whole world to see. <laughs> You know, I, I am in, I am in pants. He, he is just a chat GPT <laughs> bot, guys. That's what's I, in the background. I, I am in pants. Okay, so let me know when you can see this. All right, yeah. so this is a chart of all the nuclear reactors added in Canada from like 1971 to 1992. 1971 was 52 years ago, okay? And he's overlaid on this 18 megawatts of what we would need to do from 2025 to 2050, okay? Pathway to decarbonization. There is not a technical challenge, can't do technologies 50 years old. They invented this technology before they had calculators. So Imagine, let's talk about the substrate sourcing then. What do you mean? We just talked about the issue of, you know, China manufacturing sure. the, the, the waffles or whatever it's called for um, uh, solar panels. What, where do we get our, our substrate for nuclear? Who's processing? What are the issues with that? With a dedicated effort, there are no issues. So um, we have tons of uranium in Australia and Canada. Right now, there's a lot of it in uh, Kazakhstan, and Russia has a commercial monopoly around the enrichment needed to make SMRs work. That's a solved problem measured in the single-digit billions, and probably the military could solve that problem for us, but they're hoarding their enriched uranium for their own military purposes. Um, this is not a constraint of consequence. If we were truly in a World War II Manhattan-style project, a political project, um, getting enough uh, enriched uranium to run the fourth-generation type reactors is well well within the technical capabilities of the United States, period. Um, so again, um, these are, um, they're, they're canards. There's no other way to say it. Like it's a, it, it, it all traces back to politics. If Canada could do it 50 years ago, you, what, you're trying to tell me that the US can't do it today? How did it go so wrong, Doomberg? Because of so the wrong? politics. It, it I just, understand, it's just the, the politics and the narrative, and I, I get, you go it back went, in time, the, you see the, the you hear about the Hiroshima, the bomb. It's all tainted, right? 
Correct. Um, it is tainted. N- and no politician wants to touch it with a 10 foot pole because it's hard. And they need No, to be, because the environmentalists have been hard. extraordinarily successful in winning the propaganda war. Got, you know, hat off, hat tip to them. Like, we're the first to admit it. And the industry fell for the trap. If only we give them four more nines, they'll leave us alone and let us build these plants. No, <laughs> they're going to ask for another nine and another nine. The, the poster child for this nonsense is Yucca Mountain. Like, h- how far below and how stable, a, like, and yet Harry Reid killed it for political purposes because he was placating to the environmentalists. So, like, by engaging in the debate, which we refuse to do, they lost because it's literally Lucy, Lucy with the football. Like, ah, you thought you were going to kick it now after 19 nines of safety? Ha, 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 ha. I take the football away again. Come back when you get to 22. And it never ends. Angels on a pin. Like, find me a human being who has been injured by nuclear waste. You can't. Find so what me. are the solutions for, for, for a policy improvement in the U.S.? Uh, I mean, obviously, one one way to, 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 to carry out this thought experiment is to say you wave a magic wand, you're emperor, you would be able to implement some of the things that you're talking about. Now, within the system, within the current existing system, obviously, there's a lot of polarization. It's a very dysfunctional, probably as dysfunctional as it's been in all of our lifetimes. What solution, what path forward do you see for, for a little bit more coherence and, 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 and logic in energy policy in the U.S.? So- It starts with engaging in authentic science-based debate, which we will do. We debate anybody on on any side of the aisle and um, being willing to stand up for your scientific beliefs and participating in the existing um, political framework. And Doomberg, in our own small way, is having some influence. You know, we have a good readership on Wall Street and many people in government read us and they reach out to us and we try to do our best. You know, Chris Kiefer is an example of somebody who... um, who, uh, as a, a medical doctor, has created an amazing movement and has had an impact. He got a one-on-one meeting with Justin Trudeau, and he got you know a petition read into um, into Parliament. And um, nuclear is now redefined as green and 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 available for some of the funding that they put towards decarbonizing in Canada. And this is you know one person and a small team, and they had a real impact. And so one person can have a small impact. Now, to give you a Friday afternoon before Memorial Day, somewhat humorous idea of what we should do. I'm going to share my screen again. And I'm going to um, do my best Elon Musk. And I would walk into the, the Nuclear Regulatory Commission uh, 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 just like this. Drop uh, a sink. I, I would do to the NRC um, what uh, Elon did to the employees of Twitter. And that's not to endorse what Elon did to the employees of Twitter. Um, but uh, so, if Doomberg were to run the NRC, um, there'd be an awful lot of upset uh, government employees. So have you guys seen Mike, speaking of Mike Myers, uh, the, the Pentaveret on Netflix by Mike Myers? No, I mean, uh, masterminds, five masterminds <laughs> that control the world, but are actually good. Yeah. So I, I actually kind of envision Doomberg, I don't know, Satoshi, Jesse Livermore, you know, economic, all the uh, all the anonymous people in the background working to fix this world. I, I'm pretty sure now after an hour and a bit that this is what's happening. You I know, like that um, a lot. we're, we're <laughs> doing what we were meant to do in life. And so we intend to keep doing it. Yeah, a bunch of uh, a bunch of uh, pseudonym emojis will be running the world. I love it. I well, we're love we're it. going online anyway, right? So um, my kids are online all the time, and um, my daughter is apparently um, doing creative work online in exchange for digital money. And I'm like, do we need to file a 1099, or what? Are we, what are we doing here? And <laughs> I'm assured that we're okay because um, she's not allowed to spend them because she's not 18. But um, this is the way the world is going. And, uh, you know, we just put our sail up and our, 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 we're floating with the trade winds. So what gives you optimism? What what are you I mean, Doomberg is obviously a, a, a name with at least a bit of a negative connotation. But you, you're, you're not all doom when we hear you talk about, I mean, policy, energy policy does uh, have a, a, quite a number of problems uh, that you're laying out. But what are some of the reasons that are that are? Uh, giving you hope and, and, and cause for optimism. Yeah, Duberg is mostly a wink and a smile inside joke. We're not really pessimistic. And in fact, um, I personally am a very optimistic person. And we as a team are, would, would be long human ingenuity. Um, we have a very amazing ability, especially in the US, to try all the dumb stuff before we settle on the right answer. And we're running out of dumb stuff to try. So that gives us some hope. 
Um, we do think that ultimately when enough pain is inflicted that um, our society and Western society tends to regress back to the mean. And um, we're getting close to what we think must be the apex of pain before sanity uh, reasserts itself. And we do um, regress to the mean. Um, you know, the, the, the success of Doomberg, it gives us hope um, because this was just, you know, us with a keyboard and a Bloomberg terminal and, um, and sweat equity. I, I, we, we've said this on other podcasts, but we've invested less than $10,000 creating the Doomberg brand. Um, most of it is in the development of the animation you're looking at. Um, and some of it is sponsoring a podcast of a good friend of ours in the early days. But other than that, it's all been sort of sweat equity. Um, there is a hunger for science-based analysis. There's a hunger for authentically laying out what we believe to be, you know, um, what's right for humanity. And, and we've carved out a, an amazing set of subscribers, um, both free and paid. And we're, you know, every subscriber is precious. And, um, and so, yeah, there is a, there is a hunger for it. Um, and, and I do believe that um, we're seeing, for example, nuclear renaissance, you know, with Japan, um, even in the U.S., Canada, with Trudeau's about face, a total about face by Trudeau. Really, the only country still opposing nuclear power as a national policy is Germany. And even within the That's EU, so crazy. even in within the EU, they are becoming ever more uh, isolated in that regard. And France is sort of leading a counterpunch. And, and to Macron's credit, India, China, the United Arab Emirates, like we talked about, Korea, everybody kind of knows that if you truly want a carbon free future, you it's easy to decarbonize the grid and now plausible to decarbonize much of industry if this Dow X energy project um, proves out, at least in sort of the next 15 to 20 years. Um, so, yeah. So I'm curious, Stephen Keen, I think it's Stephen Keen that has this kind of view. Yeah, that I, I debated the him. inputs, yeah. the inputs to you know, we talk about the traditional inputs to uh, productivity, which is labor and capital. And he argues that it's actually energy costs. Yes. Um, and so if that's true and we let's say we get into a world where we can uh, have energy plants by uh, nuclear power, are we looking at a significant reduction in energy costs and therefore increase in productivity? So Stephen Keene is a fascinating guy and um, actually debated him on, on a podcast called Ford Guidance. Let me let me share my screen. And um, I quite enjoy his analysis of the economy uh, on energy, but his proposed solutions were, I don't know if, if you have a chance to listen to this debate, um, rather extreme. Um, yeah. Oh, yeah. And, um, and so we had a- We had him on, full yeah. disclosure. And so um, we, we had, um, let me stop screen. We, we had him, we debated with him, um, and it was a fun debate, actually, to his credit. He is at least totally honest and transparent about what he proposes to do. Right. Right. Yeah. And he's not um, doing it behind the scenes. And he's not right. He's not doing stuff. a bait and switch. Right. And yeah. so, um, yeah, so so he was fun to debate. He was authentic. We agreed on a lot. We agreed on the critical role of energy in the economy. And we agreed on um, uh, on the need for I, actually, I think he actually agrees on the need for nuclear power. Um, but ultimately, his sort of solutions about nationalizing oil and gas and, and some of the more extreme stuff. Um, but again, that was a great example of where um, we were willing to debate lightly and, um, and and we exchanged authentically held views in a polite way. And the audience was left to decide um, which side um, came out ahead. And, and we need more of that in society. So when you, we talk about what are the subset of things that um, give me hope, um, that's one of them. That, that we, we should begin to have these types of discussions to debate authentically and openly um, you know, um, what it is that we should be doing. And, and to his credit, um, he, he laid bare what he thinks should happen, which is we should all have a um, nationalization of fossil fuels and extreme rationing of, of rationing of energy and a massive reduction in people's standard of living because the consequence of not doing so is we're going to have a catastrophe on the planet. And, and what I said on that podcast was, well, uh, you know, um, brace for impact. And if you're saving that great bottle of wine, you better open it because we're going to run that experiment. Like the world's not going to do that, Professor King. And yeah. and he kind of agreed with me on that. And so it was kind of actually a very pleasant debate, an interesting. Oh, I got I got to watch it for sure. Um, but but again, I just want to zero in on is uh, nuclear power 
generated electricity cheaper than the current alternatives or will depends. It, can we get there with it depends fifth generation on power plants well you could do it with the old generation power plants if we had far less regulatory interference is my point what do you mean by cheap right Just why is something kill. expensive yeah. right so uranium is 50 bucks a pound that's and when you measure how much electricity you can produce from a pound of uranium that's effectively free right that's kind of my point <laughs> right and so why is nuclear expensive? It's expensive because the industry has allowed itself to be tricked into imagining that they need 19 nines of safety and 15 various forms of redundancy in order to operate a nuclear power plant. We dropped nuclear bombs on Japan and Japan is a fine place to visit today. Like we can, we could put bookends on the risks that we're taking, the trade-offs that we're taking, um, but we don't. And so measured, if, if we ran an autocratic society, um, nuclear power would be the cheapest, yeah. Right. I mean, it's just it's so crazy because it is. We're, we are we are suffering from lack of productivity, energy costs being the major major one, and we are we ha we are not waiting for a solution. We have a solution, and yes. we're being held hostage by ideology and politics. It's in, in so. A this real is another way. reason why I'm optimistic, because when we do regress to the mean, there is no invention needed. Yeah. So I'm actually quite hopeful. There's so the only so much pain people will accept before they find a Doomberg who's willing to run for office and they fix stuff. So we're coming and we got 10 more minutes left and I'm curious to hear, we got a presidential cycle coming in. DeSantis just uh, launched his bid on a glitchy Twitter um, expose. And, and so, so what, what do you think about the candidates there has anything changed do we have to wait are we still waiting for the maximum point of pain here on, from political perspective or is there some hope there i would say we're still waiting for the maximum point of political pain i don't think that any of the candidates for high office are you know let's take joe biden right um what did he do when the energy crisis hit he panicked emptied the strategic petroleum reserve you know browbeated the oil companies to produce more uh, this runs 100% counter to everything that his environmental base thinks is the right way to go, right? Because he's an old school politician. We used to jokingly call him, you know, Joe Biden, Senator D, comma, DuPont, because he was from Delaware and he would always represent DuPont's interests in the Senate. Um, he knows that his political future is tied to the price of gasoline. So I wouldn't say that um, there are a few thoughtful people on nuclear power. None of them are probably going to run for president. But ultimately, the individuals in the seat don't matter as much as the pain the public has felt. And when the individual in the seat sees the pain the public has felt and goes looking for answers, hopefully there's people around them that can teach them about nuclear power. Um, we're seeing- You're talking about pain. Yeah. Sort of cut you off there, but you, you, you're talking about pain. I, I would imagine uh, uh, a lack of energy, right? Uh, unavailability of energy, uh, broadly in the U.S. to some degree that would, 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 would precipitate a crisis that would force the need for change. That's uh, it doesn't seem like the U.S. is anywhere near, uh, uh, you know, uh, well, lacking of energy in any way. Well, we have an abundance of energy, but let's watch Germany. So the deindustrialization of Germany, the, the outflow of jobs, the rolling blackouts, the increased cost of power and electricity, and the inability to heat your home in the winter when you are relying on a heat pump because the grid is collapsed because there's too much demand. You know, um, that's the type of pain that um, we don't want to see happen, but would be necessary to occur before serious political upheaval happens. Now, that's a risk, right? The risk is you have far right wing extremism and populism take over, and this is how strong, you know, strong men come to office and and so on. Um, so we're not. We don't want that to happen. We would rather have rational, polite debate um, where people get to the correct answer in our view. And look, it's just our view. Like maybe we're wrong. Maybe some technology will be invented that magically allows wind and solar to no longer be intermittent, which magically allows it to be introduced to a grid in a way that doesn't destabilize it, which magically allows electricity be, to be uh, distributed to the masses uh, far cheaper than we do today. If that technology existed, we'd be the first to write about it and to, and to be proponents of it. It does exist today. It's called nuclear power. But if some new manifestation of wind and solar were to be invented that allowed that to happen, we'd be all for it because at least it's politically acceptable and we would rather not go through the path function of pain in order to uh, risk um, you know, society dissolving into a far uglier place than it is already today. Um, and so you know, what's, 
that the, the, any answer that is plausible and politically expedient would be all for. Intermittent wind and solar as it exists today is not plausible. Nuclear is just not politically expedient. Solving political expediency seems to us to be far easier than solving technical implausibility. I like that. I like that. It's a, it's a great way to end, I think. Uh, unless, Richard, Mike, do you have any other questions? No, I think it's a good place to put a pin and uh, great reason to have uh, Doomberg back on. There are so many questions. There are so many threads that I wanted to lay on the importance of energy and on the geopolitical stage, but uh, we'll have to leave that for the next episode. Doomberg, where can people find you? Uh, obviously, you have your your Substack uh, written underneath your, uh, your avatar there, but uh, for everyone that's listening. Yeah, that's the primary place to find us, uh, doomberg.substack.com. We are on Twitter um, at Doomberg T. T is for Twitter. Um, but we produce six to eight pieces a week. We are 100% subscriber supported. We do not accept ads or sponsorships. And as we often say, there's nothing wrong with those business models. But given how provocative we intend to be, uh, we felt uh, having complete editorial freedom uh, was, was um, uh, of paramount importance. And so while every subscriber is... Uh, precious to us, no subscriber is determinative. And so if somebody gets upset about something we write, we will persist and we will live to publish another piece. Um, and so doomberg.substack.com, come join the 160,000 plus email subscribers that we have on, um, on, a, on a product that I couldn't be more proud to produce. And I really appreciate the opportunity today. I had a blast. Time flew by. Uh, I just looked down and saw that we're 90 minutes into it, and it feels like 15. So I'm um, looking forward to coming back anytime, guys. It's been great. Love Thank it. you for coming. <clears throat> Thanks to all the Doomberg Nation folks out there. They're tuning in. Yeah. Have a great long weekend, everyone. Yeah. Thanks. This podcast is brought to you by the Resolve Long Horizon Investing Masterclass, a 10-part evergreen podcast series where Adam Butler, Mike Philbrick, and Rodrigo Gordillo of Resolve Asset Management Global explore an advanced investment framework specifically designed to steward quasi-permanent capital with humility and balance. From the science of decision-making to all-weather portfolio construction to the value of diversified alpha and tail protection, this series provides a comprehensive capital management roadmap to improve outcomes for wealthy individuals, advisors, family offices, and institutions managing less than $10 billion. To listen to the series or read the transcripts on demand, please visit investresolve.com forward slash masterclass.